my name is Chris Harris and I'm from AnnerieTutors.com and welcome to this video on exam papers and this exam paper we're going to be doing the um, OCR uh, May or June 2013 paper and this is the F321 paper so in other words just unit one um, and the whole point of this video is we're going to go through each question and I'm going to give you some little hints and tips on making sure that you can answer the exam paper uh, correctly. Um, it basically comes in two halves. So you've got one half of learning chemistry is actually learning the content, um, but that's no good if you can't answer the exam paper because that's what you're going to be assessed on to see if you understand the content. So these videos are designed to go through something called exam technique. Um, so it's a little bit like, I suppose, learning to drive. You get the rules of the book, which is the highway code, and you can read the highway code from front to back, but it doesn't mean that you can hop in the car uh, and drive around. Um, you have to actually get in the car and practice and practice. So this is a bit like driving the car, um, which is the exam technique side. Um, these would be a good idea if you can get a hold of these um, and print them off and have a go at the question yourself. And then you can use this video to uh, see if the answer is right. Not only to see if it's right, but know why it's right as well. Because um, the uh, mark scheme will tell you the answer, but it doesn't tell you why it's the answer. And sometimes it will be quite difficult to understand. So that's what I want to go through here. And they are um, freely available from the OCR website. Um, it's also um, split up the video. So if you want to go to a specific question, for example, you want to go to question uh, three or question four, um, then there's some links to the left hand side. Um, if you just click on the link for each question and it will take you straight there. Okay, so let's just make a start on this paper. So we're looking at question one, and it says silicon and potassium are two elements found in the Earth's crust. Silicon and potassium both exist as several isotopes. Uh, and then it asks to define the term relative isotopic mass. So this is just a, a definition that you really need to know. Uh, but you can see we've got two marks there. So there's two parts to this definition. Uh, and the first part being that um, the mass of the isotope uh, compared to uh, one twelfth of the mass of an atom of carbon twelve. So that's actually the full answer. So the um, the first bit is basically uh, stating this bit here. So the mass of the isotope um, compared to one twelfth. So this bit, the mass of the isotope, is the key bit. And that's that's where you get your first mark. Um, but it is relative isotopic mass, and relative means to compare it with something. So um, this is comparing to one twelfth of the mass of an atom of carbon twelve. So this bit is the really important bit there, and that actually gets you the um, second mark. This carbon-12 bit must be there. You get two marks for that, uh, but you have got to know your definitions. They're very important. All right, okay. So on to the um, next one, and it says, complete the uh, table below for an atom of an ion of two different isotopes of potassium. So you can see here that we've got uh, potassium-39, uh, and we have protons, neutrons, electrons, etc. So this is just testing your um, your understanding of uh, atomic structure. So we know we've got 19 electrons, and we know this is potassium. Um, now, in an element, which we know this is, as we can see here, the number of electrons equals the number of protons. So um, what that means is that this number is going to be uh, 19, which is going to go there. And the um, number of neutrons, all we do is we take the number of protons uh, and minus that away from 39. So if we do uh, 39 minus 19, that should tell you the number of neutrons, which should come out as 20. Okay, so um, the next one, uh, now it does say an isotope. So this means they have the um, same number of uh, protons, uh, but a different number of neutrons. You can see here we do have a different number of neutrons. Um, this has got to be potassium, so we know that for a start. Uh, so it must have 19 protons. The number of protons is unique 
to that element. So no other element will have 19 protons. So only potassium has 19. So because we know it's an isotope of potassium, this has got to be 19. So from that, we can actually work out, um, so we know this is potassium. I'm just going to put that there. Now you can see that the number of electrons is a little bit less. So in here where we had equal amounts, we had a neutral element. This one's a little bit less. So we have one less electron. So that means this must be a potassium ion. So this is plus. Um, and the number that goes here, the mass, is basically the number of protons plus the number of neutrons because this is the um, mass number. So 19 plus 22 uh, is going to be 41. So we put 41 there. And there's your answers. So you get two marks for this. Um, and the first mark comes in actually saying that we have this row and the second mark is for the second row there so you got to make sure all that's right okay and on to the um, next bit so it says complete the electron configuration of a silicon atom so what we need here is a periodic table and here's one here so our silicon atom as you can see silicon is here and so what we're going to do is we're going to run through the periodic table to see if we can try and work out the electron configuration. So we know it's uh, 1s2, because that's what we've given us there, this is the first s1. Uh, then it goes up to 2s2, uh, and it goes 2p6, 3s2, uh, 3p2, because this is in the second second element long in the 3p block. So we're just gonna write the configuration down. So this is going to be, obviously we've got 1s2 already, uh, two little s, and the little two at the top there. 2p6, 3s2, and then 3p2. There you go. Uh, and that gets you the one mark there, because that's just worth one. Okay, so on to the next question. So it says here, silicon reacts with chlorine to form molecules of silicon tetrachloride SiCl4. How many molecules are present in 8.505 grams of silicon tetrachloride? Right, so we're looking for number of molecules present. So when we see that word there, number of molecules, or how many molecules, we've got to think of Avogadro's number. And um, to work out that, we take Avogadro's number and multiply it by the number of moles that we have. So we need to work out the number of moles of this substance here. So we can work out moles by doing the mass, which is this number here, divided by the relative molecular mass of silicon chloride, silicon tetrachloride. So what we're going to do is work out the um, molecular mass of this first to enable us to work out moles, and then we can use that number to work out the number of molecules. So um, what we're going to do is you take your periodic table. Uh, there you go, MR of SiCl4. Uh, and you get your periodic table and you're looking for the mass number. Um, so the mass number of silicon is 28.1 plus four lots of 35.5. So we're just going to put that in our calculator now. So silicon is uh, 28.1 and um, we're going to add that to four times by 35.5. And then we're going to press equals and we should get 170.1. And that is our molecular mass. So I'm just going to write that down on there. 170.1. All right. Okay. So now we know this, we can work out the number of moles. And the number of moles equals the mass, and that's going to be in grams, divided by the relative molecular mass, which is the MR. Uh, and so the mass is 8.505 grams. Divide that by 170.1. Um, and that should give us, to bring our calculator over, so it's going to be uh, 8.505 divided by 170.1, uh, and it's going to give us 0 0.05. Okay, so that's going to be 0.05. And that's moles. Okay, right, so now we've worked that out, we can then work out the uh, number uh, the number of molecules, and all the number of molecules is is basically it's just the uh, number of moles multiplied by uh, Avogadro's number because Avogadro's number tells us how many molecules there are in one mole of any substance um, so um, if we had one mole there'd be one times Avogadro's number and that will tell you how many molecules there are 
Um, but we don't have one mole, we have 0 0.05 moles. So Avogadro's number you have to remember. So this is 6.02 times by 10 to the 23. So it's a big number. Uh, and all we do is we put our numbers in 0 0.05 times by 6.02 times by 10 to the 23. Uh, and bring our calculator over. So we've got our 0 0.05 already in there. So we're going to multiply that by 6.02 times by 10 to the 23. And that gets us 3.01 times by 10 to the 22. And that answer goes in there. There you go. And it's three marks. Um, so the marks come in for firstly working out the molecular mass of silicon tetrachloride. The next marks comes in where you've got the number of moles. And then obviously your answer will get an, uh, a mark as well. Um, so there you go. So that's three marks. Not too bad. Okay, and then on to the next part of this question. This is the last part of question one. Um, and it says, part two, potassium reacts with chlorine to form an ionic lattice of potassium chloride, KCl. The diagram of part of the potassium chloride lattice is shown below. Add labels to each circle in the diagram to show how the particles present in the lattice. And the diagram assumes all particles have the same size. So, um, right, this is potassium chloride. Uh, it's ionic. Um, because it uh, tells us there. So we need to put ions of potassium and chloride in there. Now, basically, you can't have two light charges right next to each other because they'll repel. So I'm just going to start by putting um, K plus in there. So next to it, we've got to have a Cl minus. And next to that one, we've got to have a Cl minus there as well. And the uh, ion next to this has got to be opposite. So that's K plus. And you can say that's opposite to chlorine. So that's fine. This one's got to be K plus because it's next to the Cl minus. This one has got to be Cl minus because it's next to the K plus. So you can see it's all fitting together. Um, this one's got to be K plus because it's opposite charge. Uh, and this one's got to be Cl minus. So as long as your ions are, uh, so your positives are always next door to a negative and vice versa, then that's how you do it. So it's not too bad. So uh, mark wise, you get one mark for having four potassiums all in the correct place. Uh, and you have one mark for all your Cl minuses all in the correct place as well. Um, it could be uh, back to front. So, for example, you could put Cl minus there and then K plus, etc. But you need to have four K pluses and four Cl minuses at least. Okay, on to the next question. Okay, so this is question two. And question two says hydrated aluminium sulfate, which is Al2SO43, dot XH2O, and chlorine, Cl2, are used in water treatment. And a student attempts to prepare hydrated aluminium sulfate by the following method. The student heats dilute sulfuric acid with an excess of solid aluminium oxide. And then the student filters off the excess aluminium oxide to obtain a colourless solution of Al2SO43. And part one says state the formula of the two main ions present in the solution of Al2SO43. So this is ionic. So um, we have two ions here, main ions. We have aluminium and we have the sulfate part. So um, aluminium is in group three. So we bring up the periodic table just to show you. Uh, you can see um, there's aluminium. So it's in group three. So it forms a three plus charge. Um, so that's going to go there. Now, because this is three plus, you can see here that we've got two lots of aluminium, so that makes it plus six in total. So these sulfate ions must be minus two because we needed three of them to balance out the plus six on this side. So these must be minus two each. So that means this is going to be SO4, two minus. So you can actually work it out if you can't actually remember it. And you can see here that gets us um, two marks. So you get one mark, obviously, for right an AL3+, plus, and uh, one mark for right an SO4, two minus. Okay. So um, next question. So it says, write an equation for the reaction of aluminium oxide, Al2O3, with sulfuric acid. And we need to include state symbols as well. So we get two marks. So one for obviously writing the equation and one for your state symbols. So make sure you put them in. So aluminium sulfate, uh, sorry, aluminium oxide, which is Al2O3, is definitely a solid. It um, it's, uh, actually comes from, obviously, a rock. Um, and then you've got uh, sulfuric acid, which is H2SO4. Now, all acids are aqueous, so that's quite easy. So you need to put AQ on the end of there. 
Uh, now we form Al2 um, SO43, which is, yeah, now this is a solution. Told us this is a solution. So this is going to be dissolved in water. So this is going to be Al2 um, SO43. Um, now this is aqueous because we said in the question that it was in solution. Uh, and um, we also form water as well. So effectively, this is like um, acid and base will give salt plus water. That's how we know we form water. Okay, uh, obviously this has got to be balanced. So you can see here, let me make that just a little bit clearer, uh, that we've got three SO4s here. So we've got to put that in bracket there, three of them. So we've only got one here, so we need to put a three there to make sure that's balanced. Uh, and then you can see our hydrogens aren't balanced now, so we need to put a three there to make sure that's balanced there as well. Uh, water is a liquid. So we need to put L on the end of that. And there's your answers. So you get obviously you get one uh, one mark for putting your state symbols, uh, and you get one mark for the uh, general equation for making sure it's correct and it's balanced as well. Okay. So um, next question. So this is part three, and it says, um, what does the dot x H two O represent uh, in the formula Al two S O four three dot x H two O? Whenever you see this, um, this is something called water of crystallization. Um, crystallization. So this is a little bit like um, basically ionic compounds are a little bit like a sponge. So you've got your uh, ionic compound there, and they will absorb water. So the this is telling us that actually for every one mole of this, one mole of this, we have a certain number of moles of water that's uh, attracted to it. So it's not actually physically chemically bonded to it, but it's attracted to it, um, a bit like a sponge. So you might have a sponge. Uh, and water can be absorbed within the sponge structure. Um, so you could say that you have either a very, very soak and wet sponge, or you might just have a, a mildly damp sponge. Um, so that basically tells you how much water is attracted to it. So we call this water crystallization. Okay, uh, and then on to the um, next bit. Now this is a calculation. It says the student heats 12.606 grams of aluminium sulfate dot XH2O crystals to constant mass. The anhydrous aluminium sulfate formed has a mass of 6.846 grams. Use the student's results to calculate the value of X and the molar mass um, of your aluminium sulfate is 342.3 grams per mole. Right, so this is working out the value of X. Now, one of the best ways to do this, I think, um, is by uh, using the uh, same method as what you would do for to work out empirical formula. So what we're going to do is split this molecule up into two columns. We're going to put Al2SO um, SO43 on one side, uh, and I'm going to put water on the other. Now, what we have to do is effectively work out the number of moles for each one of these substances here. So this is aluminium sulfate without any water, so we call this anhydrous. So we know the mass because they've told us there. So this is 6.846, that's the mass, uh, and then water um, is the basically is that number minus or well, that number minus that number, and that will tell us obviously how much water has been lost. So if we bring our calculator over, so if we do uh, twelve point six oh six uh, minus six point eight four six, uh, and that tells us five point seven six. There you go. That tells us the mass of water, because obviously that was when it had water in it, uh, and this is it without water, so that's obviously just the difference. Uh, now, to work out moles, we take obviously the mass, and we divide it by the MR of both sides. So the MR of obviously aluminium sulfate, they told us, is 342.3, uh, and water is 16 for oxygen and two hydrogens, which is going to be 18. Uh, and if we put them into our calculator, so we do this one first. So this is going to be um, 6.846 uh, divided by 342.3, uh, and that gives us number of moles of 0 0.02. Okay, and then obviously this one uh, is 5.76 uh, divided by 18, and that's going to give us 0 0.32. Okay, right. So then what we have to do is we take the smallest number of moles and divide both sides by the smallest number. 
This is the smallest number. So we're going to divide this by 0 0.02. And we're going to divide that by 0 0.02. Uh, and obviously that's just going to give us 1. Um, and this one is going to be 0 0.32 divided by 0 0.02. And that's going to give us 16. So that's a nice round number. If that was 15.9, um, then you would round it up to 16. Um, but that's just a nice round number. And um, you can see that this is a 1 to 16 ratio. So the value of water, the amount of water is 16. So x is just going to be 16. Um, so the number of marks, or where the marks come from, there's three marks up for grabs here, as it, as it says on there. You actually get one mark for working out the moles of aluminium sulfate. You get one mark for working out the moles of water. And obviously you get one mark for your answer. There's your three marks. Okay, right. So, on to the next question. Or the next part of this question, I should say. So this is B, question 2B. And it says, a student tests chlorine gas with damp blue litmus paper. And the litmus paper first turns a red colour and then bleached. A reaction takes place between chlorine and water uh, in the damp litmus paper. And it says, write the equation for the reaction between chlorine and water. And then explain why the damp litmus paper turns a red colour as a result of this reaction. So, um, the reaction... Um, is the one that you really do need to know. Um, this is chlorine, and we're going to react that with water, obviously. Uh, and what we form when we do this, this is effectively chlorine water, is we form HCl, uh, and we form something called hypochlorite, HClO. So um, you've got to remember this equation. Um, it's really, really important. Uh, and you might see, um, this might be quite obvious, um, it turns a red colour, uh, and that's because HCl is acidic. Um, so we'll put that on there. And actually, um, HClO is acidic as well because this can break off and you can have this H plus dissociate uh, just like HCl. So actually both of them are acidic. Um, but yeah, the H plus ion makes this acidic and both of these products uh, can um, dissociate, which means to break up to form your H plus, which makes them acidic. So you get two marks, you get one for the top equation and one for saying that uh, HCl or HClO either um, is acidic. Okay, and the um, last part of this one, which is part two, it says bleach is made by reacting chlorine with cold dilute aqueous sodium hydroxide. Uh, and we have to suggest the formula of the iron responsible for bleaching. Um, so this is our bleaching agent here, HClO. Um, but it says here that we are... When we take our chlorine and react it with sodium hydroxide, uh, we actually form sodium uh, hypochlorite, so that'll be NaClO. Um, and when that dissolves in water, uh, it breaks up to form Na plus and ClO minus. Now, obviously, the Na plus doesn't get involved with the bleaching. It's the ClO minus that does. Uh, and it does say ion as well. So you've got to say the ion that's responsible. Uh, and so that is actually the ClO minus ion. Um, so make sure you get that one right. So yeah, a good number of marks, 11 marks there, a little bit of calculation. Make sure you know your water of crystallization. It's uh, quite a popular, popular question. But um, yeah, as you can see, read the questions really carefully. They put some of the words in bold just to make it uh, a little bit more obvious. All right, on to the next question. Okay, so this is question three. Um, this is a big question. There's 20 marks up for grabs here for question three. So let's get started. So it says um, the hydrides of group 5 elements all exist as gases at room temperature. Phosphine gas, pH 3, can be prepared by adding phosphorus, P4, to warm concentrated aqueous sodium hydroxide as shown in the equation below. You can see they've given us it there. So it's using oxidation numbers. Explain why this is a disproportionation reaction. So try and say that one quick. So um, what we have to do is, um, well, identify what a disproportionation reaction is. Uh, this is a one where an element is simultaneously oxidized and reduced. So in this case, you can see we've got phosphorus here um, and we've got phosphorus and phosphorus there. So it's been um, oxidized and reduced in two of them. And all we have to do is basically just explain that. So the first thing we need to do is work out the oxidation state of phosphorus first. So I'm going to say P in P4, because it's an element, um, is zero. So there's your first one. Uh, phosphorus, so we'll say P in pH3, 
which is this one here, um, is now if we work this out, our hydrogens are uh, plus one. We've got three of them, so that's plus three. So that means the phosphorus has got to be minus three because there's no overall charge left on there. So in pH three is minus three. Uh, and then uh, our other one is phosphorus in, and it's in this group, this chemical here. In, so that's going to be NaH2PO2. Um, and that's going to be, you know, this one's going to be a little bit more complicated. Uh, sodium is in group one, so that's going to be plus one. Hydrogen, we've got two of them, so that's plus two in total. Oxygen is in group six. It has an oxidation state of minus two in this case, but we've got two of them, so that's going to be minus four in total. So you can see here we've got plus one, plus two, that adds up to plus three. That's a minus four, so to plug the gap, make sure it's neutral, Phosphorus in this case has got to be plus one. So uh, phosphorus in NaH2PO2 is plus one. Okay, so we've got our oxidation states. Now all we have to do is just try and explain this in terms of disproportionation. So um, we can say that the P has been, uh, and we'll say oxidized first, uh, from zero to now you can see here in here it's been oxidized so going from here to here this is oxidation because it's gone from plus one so any increase in oxidation number is oxidation and it's also been reduced the same element that we had at the start has been reduced from zero to and it's gone minus three in ph3 but that's happened in the same equation so that's why we call it a disproportionation reaction so this is uh, three marks. So you actually get one mark for stating all this, stating all the oxidation states, one for saying it's been oxidized and one for saying it's been reduced. So because it is a disproportionation reaction. Okay, right, on to uh, part two. So it says a chemist react, a chemist reacts 1.86 grams of P4 with excess sodium hydroxide. Calculate the volume of phosphine gas uh, in centimeters cubed Produced at room temperature and pressure RTP. So phosphine gas, if I just come back up here, phosphine gas was pH 3, if you can remember. So uh, what we're going to do is um, when we work out these, is we have to work out the um, number of moles first. Um, now, they've given us a mass of P4. Uh, we can work out the MR of P4 to work out the moles of phosphorus first. And then once we know the number of moles of that, we can then work out the number of moles of um, pH 3, uh, and then we can multiply that by um, 24,000, because we need it in centimeters cubed to work out the volume. So let's just go back. So we're going to work out moles of P4, and that will equal uh, mass divided by MR, and so the mass is 1.86, and we're going to divide that by, um, now phosphorus, if we bring our periodic table over, phosphorus is 31, so if we do 31 times um, 4, we should get 124.0. And right, if we put that into our calculator, let's bring it over here, so this is 1.86, divided by 124.0 uh, and that should give us uh, 0.015 moles okay uh, now what we can do is we can look at our equation uh, and you can see that this is the number of moles of p4 we need to work out the number of moles of ph3 we can see it's a one-to-one -one ratio so effectively the number of moles of p4 equals um, the number of moles of ph3 so that's also going to be 0.015 moles. Now, it's want us to work out the volume. So the volume um, of pH3 is basically going to be the number of moles, which is 0.015. And we need to multiply that by 24, because that's the, the volume that it, uh, a gas occupies at room temperature. But we need it in centimeters cubed, so it needs to be 24 thousand uh because that would be in decimeters so it needs to be in centimeters cubed 
So if we put that into our calculator, there's our 0 0.015, and we're going to multiply that by 24,000, uh, and that's going to give us 360. So the answer is 360. Okay, so 360 centimeters cubed. And if we look at the next one, which is B, it says phosphine gas burns in air to form an oxide of phosphorus, P4O10, and water. Write the equation for this reaction. Now, this one's not too bad because they've told us what's actually reacted. So phosphine gas was pH3. And it says it burns in air, so that's oxygen, because that's obviously what, what allows us to combust it in the first place. It produces phosphorus oxide, which is P4O10, and it tells us water. So they've literally told us just about um, what's in our reaction. Now all we have to do is just balance that. So you can see here that we've got four phosphorus here, so we have to stick a four there. Uh, you can see that now we have 12 hydrogens over here. So uh, to balance this, we need to put a six there, because that's 6H2. Uh, and then we just need to balance our oxygens. Um, and so we need 16 overall. So here we need 8O2. Uh, and that should balance it. And obviously that gets you the mark. Um, just to go back to this question here, just to show you where the marks come in. So you get one mark for actually working out the number of moles here first. Uh, and then you get obviously one mark for your final answer, which goes there, because that's for two marks. Okay, right. On to the next part. Okay, so this is part C, there you go, as you can see on there. So it says phosphoric acid, H3PO4, can be made by reacting P4O10 with water. Sodium phosphate, Na3PO4, is a salt that can be prepared by reacting H3PO4 with sodium hydroxide, NaOH. A student prepared a solution of Na3PO4 by reacting 15 centimeters cubed of 0.1 moles per dm cubed H3PO4 with 0.2 moles per dm cubed of sodium hydroxide. So many numbers, right? So it says, why is sodium phosphate described as a salt of H3PO4, which is phosphoric acid? Now, um, the simple answer is um, salts have these um, met lines in them. So um, what we can say is the H plus ion or ions. are replaced by Na plus ions. And that's all you need to put. Okay, so that makes it the salt bit there with the metal in there. Okay, so the next question, it says calculate the amount in moles of H3PO4 in 15 centimeters cubed of 0.1 molar uh, phosphoric acid. So um, this is just a solution. So the number of moles equals uh, concentration that's going to be in moles per decimeters cubed, multiplied by the volume. Uh, and the volume must be in decimeters cubed. So we'll convert that because they've given us that in centimeters cubed, which is quite common. Uh, concentration is 0 0.1, 0, 0, multiplied by the volume. Uh, the volume is 15, but that's centimeters cubed, but we have to convert it to decimeters cubed. And one of the ways we can do that is just by putting this times by 10 to the minus 3 which means the same as divide by a thousand, but it just makes it a little bit neater. Uh, and then if we put that in our calculator, so we have um, 0 0.100 multiplied by 15 times by 10 to the minus three, and that gives us 1.5 times by 10 to the minus three. Okay, so we're gonna write that in there. Okay, there we go. There you go, and that's the number of moles. So that's that one done. Okay, and then on to uh, part three. It says the equation for the preparation of sodium phosphate from sodium hydroxide and phosphoric acid is shown below. So it's given us the equation there. Calculate the volume of 0.2 moles per dm cubed sodium hydroxide uh, that reacts exactly with the 15 centimeters cubed of one molar phosphoric acid. And that's what we just worked out there. So um, the first thing we need to do is we need to work out the um, number of moles of sodium hydroxide uh, and then once we know the number of moles of that we can then because um, we have a concentration uh, we can then work out the volume using the same equation that we used up here so um, let's do it so uh, moles of sodium hydroxide now you can see here that this is a, a three to one ratio we know the number of moles of phosphoric acid which is here 
we need three times, you can see there's three times sodium hydroxide compared to one there. So what we need to do is just take three times by 1.5 times by 10 to the minus three. Uh, and then if we do that, we should get uh, 4.5 times by 10 to the minus three moles. Okay, so that tells us the number of moles of sodium hydroxide. Uh, and then if we take this equation and just rearrange it to work out volume, so um, volume is the number of moles um, divided by the concentration. Now, remember this volume will be in decimeters cubed if we do this. So we need to bear that in mind. So the number of moles is uh, 4.5 times by 10 to the minus 3. We're going to divide that by the concentration, which is 0 0.200. Uh, I'll bring our calculator in. So it's going to be 4.5 times by 10 to the minus 3. Divide that by 0 0.2, 0, 0, uh, and that should give us 0 0.0225. Now that's in decimeters cubed. So to get that to centimeters cubed, we need to multiply this number by 1,000. So if we move the decimal point three places to the right, so that's 1, 2, 3. That would give us 22.5. You go centimeters cubed, and that would get you the one mark for there. So there's quite a bit to do there for, for just one mark, but not too bad. Okay, uh, right, and then on to the next part. So this is um, D. So it says ammonia NH3 is another gaseous group 5 hydride. NH3 and pH3 are both simple molecules. The boiling points of NH3 and pH3 are shown in the table below. So you can see here. The boiling point of NH3 is obviously higher than pH3. Okay, so let's complete the table below to show the main intermolecular forces present in NH3 and pH3. Okay, so we've got NH3 and pH3. The main intermolecular force here in ammonia, which is NH3, uh, is going to be hydrogen bonding. And I can tell you why. Uh, obviously, the molecule must have hydrogen. For any of these, if it's N, O, or F and a hydrogen, these all have hydrogen bonding. So NOF and hydrogen, these are the ones that have hydrogen bonding. Um, if it doesn't have any of these in, there won't be any hydrogen bonding. Now, because NH3 has nitrogen in there and a hydrogen, we say the strongest one is hydrogen bonding. So, all right. Uh, and then pH3 um, is actually permanent dipole. We've got a slight polarity there. So that is a um, permanent dipole dipole. Okay, so um, some polarity there, but again, it's not as strong as a hydrogen bond. Okay, so we get two marks there. So you get obviously one for the top one and one for the second one. Right, it then goes on to say, suggest why pH3 has a lower boiling point than NH3. Uh, and the simple matter of the fact is that it's a weaker intermolecular force. So we'll put that in there. Weaker intermolecular forces in uh, pH3 than in NH3. Okay, so uh, yeah, dipole dipoles are, are weaker than hydrogen bonding, and then you have van der Waals, uh, where you don't have any or very little um, um, polarity in the molecule, then we call that a van der Waals force, and that's the weakest one of all of them. Okay, and on to part E. Okay, so here it says NH3 reacts with molecules of BF3 to form H3NBF3 as shown below. So one of the bonds in H3NBF3 is a dative covalent bond. A covalent bond is a shared pair of electrons. So what is a dative covalent bond? So a dative covalent bond is um, simply where uh, both electrons are donated from one atom. So in this case, um, the nitrogen actually has a lone pair of electrons on there, uh, and this is a, effectively putting the electrons onto the boron there. So this nitrogen is giving up the electrons to the boron, and obviously that gets you the mark there. Okay, so on to the next bit of the question. 
Right, so now we're seeing draw a dot and cross diagram to show the bonding in H3 and BF3. Label the date of covalent bond in your diagram, and all we need to do is show out of electrons only, so we don't need to get carried away here. So uh, let's make a start. So if we look at um, boron, now boron, if we bring our periodic table over, um, is in group uh, three, so it has three electrons in its outer shell, and them three electrons are involved in bonding with fluorine. So we're just going to draw them um, on here. So there's our fluorine. Now fluorine is in group seven. So it has seven electrons of its own. So, so make sure that fluorine has seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's the, the cross represents the electron for boron. Okay, so there's the BF3. And uh, we've got NH3. Now nitrogen, bring up the period table again. Nitrogen is in group five, so it has five electrons in its outer shell. Um, and three of them are involved in bonding because it's NH3. So what that leaves us with, so I've put my nitrogen there, um, what it leaves us with is the two electrons are being donated to boron. We have a cross, dot cross there for the hydrogen. And the dots in this case represent nitrogen's electrons. So it's one, two, three, four, five electrons, one electron each for hydrogen. And your date of covalent bond is there. All right, okay, so this is effectively donating both electrons to the boron. So you get two marks here. You get one mark for saying date of covalent bond, and one mark for drawing your correct structure like that. And that's what it should look like. Okay, right, and on to the next bit. So this is part uh, three. It says the FBF bond angle in BF3 is different from the FBF bond angle in H3NBF3. Complete the table to predict the FBF bond angles in BF3 and in H3NBF3. So you can see here that in um, the BF3, boron is actually, um, let's just quickly draw the diagram. We said it was in group three, so it has no lone pairs, so it forms this. And so the bond angle between there is 120 degrees. Uh, whereas in the uh, H3NBF3, which is this one here, you can see that actually we've got like a tetrahedral structure here, because um, we, now we've got the nitrogen there. So um, because it's tetrahedral, this is going to be 109.5 degrees. Uh, and the 0.5 bit is very, very important. So you get two marks for that. Uh, you get one mark for saying, obviously, 120, and then one mark for saying 109.5. But yeah, if you look at the structure there, it is uh, a tetrahedral structure. Okay, and then on to the last bit of this mammoth question. And it says the HNH bond angle in NH3 is 107 degrees. A student predicted that the HNH bond angle in H3NBF3 is larger. Explain why the student might expect the HNH bond angle to be larger in H3NBF3 than in NH3. So what we need to do is we need to um, look at the um, number of bond pairs and lone pairs in each molecule. So we'll start with ammonia first because that's, um, that's the simpler one. So the N in NH3 uh, has uh, one lone pair and uh, three bonding pairs. Okay, so there's our uh, kind of first point, I suppose, that we can say. Uh, now we need to look at the nitrogen uh, in... Now, this was H3 and BF3 has four bonding pairs. Um, four bonding pairs and no lone pairs. So if we draw NH3, you can see. NH3 will look something a little bit like this. So you can see there, there's our NH3, and it has a lone pair on there. So you've got two, three bonding pairs and one lone pair. Whereas in our H3 and BF3, if I just pull this down here, you can see that actually, um, you can see we've got one, two, three, four bonding pairs there now, because they're all four involved in bonding. So that's going to have quite an impact on our uh, 
uh, on our on our bond angle, uh, and the reason why is because this lone pair here will actually push these bonds further away. They'll repel them, um, and so actually what we get is a, a smaller bond angle than we do if it was tetrahedral. So um, that's what we need to put there, just as our final remark. So the lone pair um, of electrons uh, repel more than bonding pairs. And it's very important that you make that comparison. You've got to say that it repels more than bonding pairs. You've got to make sure you include that bit as well. If you just say they repel more, you won't get that mark. So it's really important that you do make that comparison. You're as specific as you can. Remember, you're trying to prove to the examiner uh, that you really do know what you're talking about. Okay, so we've got three marks here, uh, and you literally get one mark for saying that um, the number of lone pairs and bond pairs there. You get one mark for saying lone pairs and bond pairs in, in the other molecule, uh, and then you need to make the statement that the lone pairs actually repel more, so that means the bond angle is smaller. Um, so that gets to the third mark there. So you can see it's a mammoth question. We've got a big load of marks there. That's 20 marks that's available. Uh, you know, make sure you're specific with these questions. Uh, more calculations are absolutely crucial, as you can see. Okay, on to the next question. Okay, so this is question four. And um, question four is starts with a big five mark question. And it says group two elements react with halogens. Describe and explain the trend in reactivity of group two elements with chlorine as the group is descended. In your answer, you should use appropriate technical terms spelled correctly. So they're obviously looking for this uh, good use of key terminology. So there's five marks up for grabs. So first of all, we need to um, describe the trend first, and that would get us our first mark. So as we go uh, down group two, the, um, the elements become less reactive. So that's what we're going to put to start off with. So uh, they become less reactive uh, down the group. All right, okay, so there's our first part. Now we, we need to explain the trend of this as well. So when we're talking about reactivity, we need to talk about the um, ability for the atom to lose electrons because chemical reactions occur because electrons are being removed uh, or they're going from one place to another. Now, what governs that ability to remove the electrons is uh, a few different things. So you've got nuclear charge, which is the effect of the nucleus pulling the electrons in. We've also got the size of the atom. Obviously, the further away the electron is from that positive nucleus, the easier it is to remove. Um, and we're also talking about shielding as well. So we're going to introduce all them terms and put them in and try and explain why it's less reactive. So what we need to say is the first thing we need to say is as we go down the group, the atomic radius increases. Okay, so we'll put... Um, I'll write this down. Atomic radius increases. as we descend um, and what effect that has is the atomic radius increases because we've got more shells of electrons and um, now because we've got more shells as we go down we've also got increased shielding so we'll put that down as well now we have to say more shielding um, it's important that we make that comparison we can't just say there is shielding because there's shielding in elements right at the top as well. But there's more as we go down that group. Now, shielding is the effect. Um, you have the nucleus in the middle and then you have your shells that go around. So the more shells between your outer electron uh, and the nucleus, then this has an effect on how strongly this electron is pulled in by the nucleus. And the more shells we have in between that, uh, the more shielding we have and the easier it is to remove that electron away from the atom. OK, so um, what we need to say is that actually as we go down the group, we do get more protons in the nucleus. So you might think, well, actually, because we've got more protons in here, surely that means it's pulling this electron a lot more. And that's true. However, the shielding effect vastly outweighs any increase in nuclear charge. And we've got to make that comment there as well to acknowledge the fact that there is more protons, but the shielding uh, outweighs that. So we're just going to put that on there as well. So the shielding um, effect uh, 
uh, outweighs the increased uh, nuclear charge. All right, okay. Um, and so we need to obviously say the effects of that, um, and like I say, all the way through these answers, because of all these uh, uh, parts here, we can say that actually the outer electron is obviously lost more easily as a result of what we've just said there. So we're just going to put that just to finish up. Okay, so this means the outer electron is lost more readily. All right, there you go. So that gets us um, the five marks. I'll just show you where the marks come in. We get one mark, for obviously, stating describing what the trend is. Uh, we need one mark on any comment of atomic radius increasing. Uh, and we get a mark for commenting on the shielding as well. Uh, then we need a mark for describing the uh, fact that shielding outweighs the nuclear charge, but we've acknowledged nuclear charge at least. Uh, and you get one mark for a comment on uh, about the um, uh, how readily the electron is removed from the outer shell. So this basically just uh, links the whole lot together. So you can see one, two, three, four, five marks that's available for that question. Okay, right, on to the next part, question four. So... We can see here, it says, a student was provided with an aqueous solution of calcium iodide. Uh, the student carried out a chemical test to show that the solution contained iodide ions. In this test, a precipitation reaction took place. It says, state the reagent that the student would need to add to the solution of calcium iodide. So uh, when we are testing for halide ions, which are these here, uh, the reagent to identify them, uh, and it says a precipitation reaction took place. So the only chemical that you can use or that you should know is silver nitrate, which is AgNO3. And you can write silver nitrate instead if you want. And then it says, what observation would you show that the solution contained iodine ions? Now with this one, you would see yellow. Because it's an observation, you've got to say precipitate as well. If you miss out precipitate, then you uh, lose the mark. And likewise, if you miss out yellow, you'd lose the mark as well. So um, iodide is yellow, um, chloride is going to be, now if we bring the periodic table over, um, chloride would give, this one here, would give a, a white precipitate, uh, bromine would be a cream precipitate, and iodide is yellow. So there's your halogens there, so just a reminder. Okay, so it says write an ionic equation including state symbols for the reaction that took place. So this is an ionic equation, so we've just got obviously silver nitrate is the silver ion, that we need, and all ions are aqueous. That's really important. Um, so in practical terms, they're all aqueous. Uh, and this is reacting with iodide ions, which again is aqueous. And that's going to produce your silver iodide. And this is your precipitate. This is the yellow precipitate, what you're forming there. But it does say an ionic equation. So it's only the ions. The nitrate is a spectator ion. Um, and whatever the uh, iodide was, which is calcium, is um, is a spectator ion as well. All right, okay. And in the last question, it says the student is provided with an aqueous solution of calcium bromide that is contaminated with calcium iodide. The student carries out the same chemical test, but this time needs to add a second reagent to show that iodide ions are present. It says state the second reagent that the student would need to add. So um, obviously we're distinguishing both of them would give a color that's quite... Um, uh, similar, so we've got a cream and a yellow, uh, and one way to distinguish the two is that if we add concentrated ammonia, um, so that would be our reagent, concentrated uh, ammonia, which is NH3, uh, if we add concentrated ammonia to this, uh, our bromide ion, or silver bromide that we form after we've added our silver nitrate, uh, would actually dissolve uh, in the um, uh, concentrated ammonia uh, and the iodide won't it's insoluble even in concentrated ammonia so there you go nine marks um, a few reagents there make sure you know your reagents but definitely for a the first part you make sure you get all the keywords in there and you are really specific the examiners absolutely love key terminology obviously in the right context as well but that's it on to the next question okay and this is question five and this is the final question on the test 
So it says periodicity is a repeating pattern across different periods. So it's first ionization energy shows a trend across period two. The first ionization energies of lithium, carbon, and fluorine are shown in table 5.1 below. You can see they've given us that set of data there. And it says explain the trend across period two shown in table 5.1. In your answer, you should use appropriate technical terms spelled correctly. So if we have a look at our, um, our information here, so it's talked about lithium, carbon, and fluorine. So there's lithium, there's carbon, and there's fluorine just at the end there. So we're talking about the going across the um, period two. So um, we need to basically try and um, say why this first ionization energy, which is the amount of energy required to move one mole of electrons from one mole of a element in the gaseous state. So um, effectively why this is increasing. So we've basically got to look at that and think, well, actually, as we go across the period, we've got more protons in the nucleus. And so that's going to have an effect um, about pulling the electrons um, towards the um, nucleus. So the more protons you've got, the stronger the attractive forces. Um, and also, because we're not actually adding any more shells as we go across the period, the um, shielding is actually the same. So this is the type of thing that we need to talk about in this question here. OK, so we're going to start with our first point. And so we're going to say that as we go across the um, the period, the number of protons uh, in the nucleus uh, increases. Um, or we can say they we have a greater nuclear charge. All right, okay, so, um, and then we also need to say that actually, like I say, as we go across the period, we're not actually adding any more shells, so the uh, level of shielding is actually the same. And remember, it's this outer electron that we're trying to remove. So, um, outer electron is exposed um, to the same level same level of shielding okay um, and because it's exposed to the same level of shielding then actually the um, the uh, because well it's the same level of shielding but we have more uh, protons in the nucleus then what that means is we overall have a greater attraction to that nucleus so the attractive force is a lot greater so we're just going to put that on there so uh, this means a greater attraction uh, to the nucleus. All right, so they're looking for key things here. So obviously we've got protons, we've got the word uh, shielding, we've got attraction, we've got nucleus there, and we've got nuclear charge. So we're getting all these key words in there. They've got to be in there. This is appropriate technical terms. And they've got to be spelled correctly as well. So things like nucleus without the E, there's no E in there. That's probably a common one. Things like um, protons, shielding, i.e., you know, so just make sure your keywords are actually um, spelt correctly because you would lose a mark if you didn't do that. So this is three marks. So we get one mark for um, talking about the fact that we have more protons. Uh, second mark for a comment on shielding, the fact that it's the same. And then the third mark is just stating that there's a bigger attraction or greater attraction to the nucleus. Okay. Uh, and then on to the uh, next bit. So this is part two. So solid carbon exists in two forms, diamond and graphite. Explain why it's unnecessary to refer to carbon as either diamond or graphite in table 5.1. So if we come back to table 5.1, you can see we've just called it um, carbon and we haven't actually called it diamond or graphite. And so it's wanting to know uh, why it's not appropriate. Now, for this, you actually need to understand what we mean by first ionization. And to ionize something, all of these elements have to be in a gaseous state. That is the official definition of it. So it's the amount of energy required to remove one mole of electrons from one mole of a substance in the gaseous state. Um, now, diamond and graphite are not gases, they're solids. So um, we can't call that uh, diamond or graphite because the atoms have to be in the gaseous state. So we're just going to put that on there. So that was a little bit tricky, I suppose. Um, you have to know that one to get this one right. Uh, 
I'm in the gaseous state. All right, okay, so there's your there's your mark there. And on to the last, the last part. So let's pull this down just so we can see the, see the whole table. There we go. Okay, so it says um, lithium carbon in the form of diamonds and fluorine have very different melting points. These differences in melting points are the result of different types of structure and different forces or bonds between the particles in the structures. Part of the table below has been filled in and we just have to complete it. So we've got the melting points there of lithium carbon and diamond form and fluorine. Uh, and now we need to talk about the um, structure. So the structure for lithium is giant. Um, so they've given us that. So for diamond, um, it is also giant. It's a big giant structure. So we're going to put giant there. Uh, fluorine simple. Okay, uh, lithium, the um, force or bond to overcome on melting is a metallic bond. Uh, with diamond, um, this is a giant covalent structure. So we've got to actually uh, break a covalent bond, which is going to take an incredible amount of energy. So it's the covalent bond. Uh, and with fluorine, because fluorine is uh, just a, a molecule, uh, and we have little fluorine molecules kind of moving around, we actually have little forces between the fluorine, and this is a, a van der Waals, and that's what we've got to break to um, to actually turn it into a gas, or when we when we're melting them. So uh, with this one, we're just it's just van der Waals. So it's a, a heck of a lot uh, less energy required to break a van der Waals. Uh, force than it is to break a bond, which is a lot stronger. Okay, uh, and then it says particles between which the force or bond is acting. So for lithium, obviously we have uh, Li plus ions, uh, and these are attracted to a sea of delocalized electrons. So um, that's very important that we get that bit right. Uh, and carbon, uh, what we're doing is we are, uh, the particles in carbon, obviously we're breaking a covalent bond. So these are atoms, because covalent bonds exist between atoms. Uh, and with fluorine, uh, we're, this is a weak force between molecules. You can see there's a molecule of fluorine there, and there's the weak force between them. So we're not actually breaking this bond, uh, we're weakening the forces here. So this is actually between molecules. There you go. Okay. And this was for six marks, as you can see on the bottom there. So we're just going to assign the marks. Um, you can see there's six boxes. So it's basically a mark per box. So you get one mark there, one there, three, four, five, six marks. So a bucket load of marks um, for what is relatively straightforward. It's just basic structures. But make sure you're reading these uh, headings ca uh, correctly to make sure that you're getting all the marks. So in total, a good good load of 10 marks for that question but um that's the end of the paper bye bye